Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylord. And I'm Dan Barker. We're co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers, which works as a state church watchdog. We invite you to join us or ask for more information, including a sample of our newspaper, Free Thought Today, at FFRF. Org. We're very delighted that our guest today is Congressman Jerry McNerney, who's a member of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus and represents the 9th District in California, the Stockton area. He has a doctorate in math, and after working on uh, national security programs, he became chief executive of a turbine company and uh, is working on environmental issues uh, since then. Representative Jerry McNerney was first elected to the U.S. House in 2006. He serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee and Science, Space, and Technology. Representative McNerney is interested in exploring the emerging study of geoengineering, and we'll have to ask him what that is, geoengineering, to address the challenges of climate change. So thanks so much for joining us in your busy day, Representative McNerney. Well, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to talk to you and share some of these ideas. Yeah, before we talk about those ideas, I noticed that you are a twin. I always notice that because I'm a twin. Are you identical or fraternal? Well, I have a twin brother. He's uh, born a little before me and he's uh, taller um, than I am and we uh, get along just fine. That's just like me. I have a twin brother. And Dan, I think we have a, a math quiz. You were oh, yeah, so you uh, have a, a, a doctorate in science and math. So we're supposed to ask you, what is the derivative of x squared? This is a, this is a quiz. See if you know it. Well, the derivative of x squared is 2x. 2x. That was a fairly simple one. <laughs> oh, it was. OK. Well, very good. Well, this is probably a simple question, too. But um, we're so grateful that you're a member of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. And we wanted to ask, uh, why do you support the Free Thought Caucus? Well, I think the important thing is that we base as much legislation as possible on reason and uh, logic, science, evidence-based. Uh, a lot of our policies can be advanced that would uh, be based on those, uh, those foundations. And I think that's very important. And also, um, there are legislative ideas that are proposed that would weaken uh, the separation of church and state. I think it's important and incumbent upon the caucus to oppose that sort of legislation. Well, here, here. I think it's also important to say that uh, you don't have to be non-religious to be a member of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. You're, you're Roman Catholic, for example. So why are you such a strong supporter of the separation of church and state? Well, I think uh, once you start uh, using religious dogma, or religious I ideology, uh, or require uh, rituals uh, that are religious-based, you, you introduce an element in, into governance that uh, can be uh, difficult and, and uh, perhaps dangerous for members of society that don't agree with those ideas. Uh, if we want to move forward as a great nation, and everybody does that want to move forward as a great nation, we need to have ideas from the entire spectrum uh, of our society uh, and work together on a collaboration, uh, which is really the only way uh, to make legislation that's sustainable and, and beneficial. So I think that's, uh, that's the fundamentals of it. Uh, I've seen in history, I mean, I was alive uh, during the Iranian Revolution <clears throat> when they started to impose uh, religious law on the people and there were, there were uh, massacres and murders. And uh, we see this even today where religiously uh, controlled governments can be very, uh, very uh, dictatorial and, uh, and dangerous uh, to live in. We saw how the denial of facts, the denial of science, how religious extremism was quite a factor in the January 6th insurrection. And uh, what was it like for you? Were you there? Were you observing it? Uh, what was happening in your, from your perspective? Well, I was in my office, which is across Independence Avenue from the Capitol. Um, you know, we have a pandemic in progress, and uh, Speaker Pelosi asked as many members to stay out of the House uh, floor and the Capitol building as possible to prevent spreading the disease. But from my office, I could see the buildup 
uh, of the crowd on the West Capitol side wow. uh, was clearly uh, intent on, on, on harm. And uh, throughout the day, we got messages from the Capitol Police to stay away from the windows, uh, to not make too much noise in your office, to attract attention, uh, and, and stay low. And, and so that was definitely unnerving. But I also saw videos from the House floor where uh, people were banging, uh, trying to get in and, and cause harm to some of my colleagues. So it was very disturbing. Very scary. Now, after the uh, insurrection, you and several of your colleagues wrote a letter to the Department of Justice uh, asking to uh, declare these individuals to be seditious. Do you want to explain the background of that? Well, sure. Back in September, um, the, 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 the then appointed um, who would be attorney general uh, sent out a memo requesting that people that were engaging in the Black Lives Matters protests, which were largely peaceful, to be uh, arrested and charged with, with sedition and, uh, and, 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 and very serious crimes uh, and prosecuted uh, very hardly. Uh, and now we see this uh, mob attack on the Capitol. Uh, and, and these people were actually intent on harming uh, Capitol Police officers on staff members and members of Congress. Uh, you could hear him chant, hang Mike Pence, the vice president. Uh, they were interested in, in capturing, uh, taking hostages and, and killing people. So uh, this was extremely serious and extremely dangerous. So these folks ought to be charged at least as harshly as the attorney general intended to charge peaceful protesters. Uh, and you know, the protesters in Black Lives Matters, uh, many of those were people of color, whereas the protesters uh, and the mob uh, that took place on uh, on January the 6th were largely white uh, supremacists, uh, and so they should uh, face the same sort of penalties at least as harshly as people were participating in peaceful protests back in September. So it wasn't just those angry extremist protesters in the insurgency, it was also some members of Congress who voted not to certify the election. And you recently voted to strip uh, Representative Green of her committee assignments. Why did you do that? Well, we have, uh, in this case, uh, a person who, who made some very uh, racist, inflammatory uh, statements that were, were clearly false and clearly not true. And I think people need to be responsible for their uh, statements and actions. Uh, so if she was going to engage in this sort of activity, uh, which would uh, ultimately uh, possibly incite people to create violence, then she should be held accountable. Uh, unfortunately, um, the minority leader, uh, Kevin McCarthy, didn't have the courage to, to punish her. And so it was incumbent upon uh, the entire Congress uh, to take action to prevent her from uh, spewing, uh, especially on the Education Committee, uh, which she had been assigned by the Republican conference, uh, theories about the Parkland uh, massacre and the Sandy Hook massacre. Uh, I, I think it was clearly uh, needed, uh, uh, and uh, I com uh, completely support that effort to remove her from those committee assignments. So do you feel that there is still an element in Congress uh, that, that has the same kinds of Christian nationalist, white supremacist attitudes that Representative Green portrays? I mean, isn't there still a problem? It must be very awkward. Well, uh, I mean, first of all, I want to say there's an important distinction between Christians that are, are uh, live, you know, by Christian ideas. Um, I, myself, I was raised a Catholic, um, and those who would be white supremacists. Yeah. Uh, and I think there is clearly an element of white supremacists in a few members uh, of the Republican conference. And uh, it's quite disturbing to have those members. Some of them have advocated uh, hanging or executing Democrats. I mean, I think that's completely unacceptable. So yeah, it, it is disturbing uh, because of that element. Uh, we've had to in, uh, impose magnetometers on entrances to the House floor so that we don't have members of Congress bringing in uh, uh, lethal weapons that could be used in, in, uh, in within the House floor during debates on important issues. Uh, yeah, I think we've we've changed uh, the nature of the institution because of that element that we now have to contend with. Well, so, I'm so sorry you do have to contend with that, that our country has to contend with it. Yeah, who would have thought it would come to something like this? But 
So back to the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. I think there's 14 members now, and it's growing since it started two years ago. And one of the bills that you were watching or advocating was the Scientific Integrity Act. I, I, we just heard that President Biden signed some kind of a memorandum on scientific integrity. Is that enough, or are you going to still advocate for this this act to be passed? I think it's it's. I'm just delighted that the President Obama, uh, sorry, President Biden is taking these sorts of steps. I think it's it's needed. Uh, it'll get our country on on the right track, uh, and uh, we're going to continue to support that. But we saw we just had four years of a president who didn't uh, support that, and he came too close, in my opinion, to winning the last election. Uh, so uh, if we have to depend on the president to uphold scientific integrity, we may be in trouble. We need a law uh, that is passed by Congress and signed by the president of the United States to ensure that we have scientific integrity in, in our nation as we move forward. So um, could you explain a little bit more about what the Scientific Integrity Act would, uh, would engender? Um, it, it's pretty pervasive, isn't it, that every branch of government, every cabinet level, everybody would have to uh, acknowledge the integrity of science, but how, how would that really work? Well, I, I don't want to get into the details, um, but, but I just want to say uh, we want to have science and evidence based, uh, you know, uh, reasoning uh, when laws are made and when rules are made in the different agencies of the federal government. And I think that's basically the intent uh, of what this act would do is, is ensure that uh, evidence and, and reason and science are at least brought into the consideration as we move forward with, uh, with laws and rules. Well, here, here, <laughs> about time. So uh, what did you call it, geoengineering, is that right? Uh, dealing with climate change, what is that? Well, um, geoengineering is a, a little bit of a, um, of a misnomer. Basically, we see that the climate is heating up uh, as a result of human uh, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and so on. And uh, we're on the path to uh, perhaps catastrophic change in our climate. So we need to be taking all the steps that we possibly can to prevent uh, major change in, in the environment which could be ruinous to civilization. So uh, first of all, we need to focus on removing uh, carbon from the atmosphere. We need to uh, reduce carbon emissions. You know, if you're, uh, the old saying, if you're in a hole, stop digging. I think it's well time to stop digging. Uh, and there's a lot of technology, whether it's uh, carbon farming, uh, you know, improving carbon uh, content in the soils, uh, whether it's clean energy, uh, low, uh, low emission buildings, transportation, uh, uh, all of these things need to be transformed uh, as soon as possible. But even if we do that, we're already on a very dangerous path uh, of heating up the atmosphere. Uh, we could see catastrophic events like a collapse of, a, of a, an Arctic ice sheet or uh, emissions of uh, methane from the permafrost in, in the northern latitudes. So we need to be ready to take whatever steps are, are necessary to protect civilization. Uh, and so um, right now what I'm proposing and what I'm supporting is developing the science to understand uh, what steps would be appropriate uh, if it comes uh, to it uh, to cool, to actively cool the atmosphere. Does that mean um, uh, producing more uh, white clouds that reduce sun that reflect sunlight? Uh, would it mean uh, injecting particles into the uh, uh, stratosphere that would uh, reflect sunlight to start to cool the atmosphere? These are big questions that need scientific analysis uh, so that we understand uh, if we have to take those steps, uh, what what the what, what the uh, downsides might be, what the effects might be. We also need uh, a large governance of this. Uh, it needs to be an international, effort. We can't just do that as the United States of America. We have to have buy-in from uh, all the countries in the world. Uh, what steps are appropriate? Uh, what science tells us is, is uh, the right thing to do? Uh, and, and then move forward if we have to in a very deliberate and uh, uh, cautious manner. 
Well, we have to take a break now. Uh, Representative McNerney, when we come back, we want to talk a little bit more about um, climate change, what you're working on, and also some of the other goals of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Jarvis, and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. There are many reasons why I'm an atheist, but I'll start with the crudest explanation. I'm sure many of you have seen Clash of the Titans or The Immortals or 300, these blockbuster films about ancient Greek or Roman religion, which we now call mythology. But back then it wasn't mythology. It was very real for them. They genuinely believed that you had to put a coin in a person's mouth before they were buried so that they could pay for the literal ferry to the afterlife. Just as many people today believe that they should eat crackers and wine on a Sunday or that God wants women to hide their bodies under black burqas. Every religion that has ever existed, and there are many, have all believed that they were right, that their rituals and rules and beliefs were 100% correct. And they all thought they nailed it. But where are they today? Uh, if they're not completely forgotten, they're on the silver screen, amusing us with their sword fights, animal sacrifices, and oracles. The religions of today are the entertainment of tomorrow. Everyone, I hope, is an atheist about Zeus and Apollo, Juno and Poseidon. I just added Jesus and Muhammad to that list. And we're back with Free Thought Matters, continuing our conversation with Representative Jerry McNerney of California, the Stockton area. When I was a preacher, I used to preach up in Stockton, California, up in the, up in the Central Valley up there. So your background is in science. Uh, you worked in the turbine industry, and you named your daughter Wendy, W-I-N-D-Y, which is really cute. Are your kids, do, do your kids care about science? Oh, yes. Um, I have three adult children. Uh, one of them is a uh, Wendy. She's a neuroscientist. She works at the Palo Alto Veterans Administration and teaches at Stanford. Uh, my youngest son is a uh, biophysicist and he works for Intel Corporation in the P Portland area. Uh, and my oldest son is uh, an attorney working in cyber security I issues um, in Palo Alto in the, in the uh, Silicon Valley area. So we're a science-based family. Wow. So I know you were in security yourself, but you, uh, you were part of a turbine company dealing with using wind as a clean energy. Could you talk a little bit more about that and how that can help save our environment? Well, I just, I loved working in wind energy. Uh, it was fun. We, we were there in the beginning. We got a plain piece of paper. We designed uh, different ideas and put them, into, uh, put them into action. And it was just very rewarding to see uh, wind energy, I think, uh, as well as solar, are very promising. We see uh, it being competitive uh, with fossil fuels and more than competitive in many situations. Uh, there's huge wind uh, and, re and solar resource. Uh, offshore wind now is growing uh, with some of the magnificent wind turbines you see uh, going in, uh, especially in Europe and now in uh, North America. So this is the most exciting field. A lot of growth ahead of us. I think we can supply quite a bit of the world's energy just from uh, pure renewables. So I think that you have some bragging rights. I think you've uh, quoted how much um, energy you saved, your turbine company saved when you were there. I can't remember the statistics, but, but it was quite impressive. Well, that's right. Uh, you know, uh, when you, you, you create wind energy or, or renewable energy, you're, taking, uh, ener you're creating energy that doesn't use fossil fuels. Uh, I think I created the uh, uh, equivalent of, of 30, or saved the equivalent of 30 million tons of carbon dioxide from being uh, emitted to the atmosphere by the energy created by just our early wind turbine farms. Wow, well you should go into government then, <laughs> <laughs> with what you know. So I read about you that as a young man, you uh, were accepted at West Point, but because of the Vietnam War, was that the reason you dropped out? 
Well, uh, I was a cadet, and I just want to say um, I have the greatest respect and admiration for uh, the military academy and, and, and the Naval Academy Air Force Academy. Tremendous training ground for, for future leaders of our country. But um, what I realized uh, was that as an officer in the United States Army, I would be required to lead soldiers into a war that I may be morally opposed to. So to me, that didn't quite uh, fit uh, with where I wanted to go in life. Uh, leading soldiers into wars that I was morally opposed to would be um, more than difficult for me. So uh, it was appropriate uh, for me to leave the academy. So you're talking about uh, protesting the Vietnam War. Well, the Vietnam was in progress when I was there, so it, it, it brought in the clear relief. Uh, of course, I was opposed to the war, but I didn't leave in a protest. I left because I couldn't see myself leading soldiers into that war or uh, for example, the second Iraq war, that would be a more a war I would be morally opposed to uh, and would have been required to lead soldiers in, into uh, in that situation as well. So uh, in general, um, I, I just wasn't able to to uh, see myself doing that. So did you find that this experience kind of framed your future beliefs and your future political convictions? Uh, possibly. Um, you know, a lot of things go into what uh, give you your life convictions. As I mentioned, my, my uh, Catholic upbringing has uh, a lot of influence on my thinking. Uh, going to uh, that uh, the United States Military Academy, I went to a uh, Catholic military boarding school in Kansas when I was in high school. Uh, and then I went into mathematics and science. So all of these things, and I, I've been a, a very big uh, um, uh, fan of philosophy, uh, whether it's the ancient Greeks, Plato, Aristotle, whether it's the modern uh, German uh, idealist Kant and Hegel, or whether it's the postmodernists, or, or um, uh, so I just love the ideas that are presented and I want to understand them and see how they uh, can influence uh, current life. Well, we do see that there are different kinds of Catholics, different kinds of Christians, and just because you're a Catholic doesn't mean you necessarily agree with everything that the Vatican says, especially on pro-life and abortion and women's rights and gay rights and all of that. So you represent one side of that religion, don't you? Well, I don't want to say that I represent a uh, <laughs> religion, but uh, I just, uh, I, I have a tremendous amount of, of respect uh, and love for the, the ideas uh, of human rights, uh, treating everybody with respect. I mean, if you look, uh, for example, at, at the uh, the Sermon on, on the Mount, when Jesus talked about uh, the poor and, and the dispossessed, uh, those are things that have a big influence on me. So we don't have very much time left, but uh, to get back into some weeds with the budget reconciliation, reconciliation bill, do you have any uh, priorities there uh, in terms of environment or the Congressional Free Thought Caucus? I or think in general? My, well, my focus, I think, would really be infrastructure. We really need uh, to work on infrastructure. We haven't had uh, a decent infrastructure bill for quite a while. The last four years have been a promise of one, but we haven't seen anything. Now it's time to get concrete. We need to work uh, on uh, on our roads and our waterways, on our bridges and our uh, our sewer systems, our, our ports of entry, our, our, our broadband, our power systems. All these things need investment right now. But... We also need to invest significantly in uh, recovering from this pandemic. We want to fight this virus. We want to crush the virus. We want to get people back to work. Uh, so there's a tremendous opportunity. All these things are going to create uh, opportunities for people, are going to create employment, uh, and it's going to put our nation onto a path uh, of great uh, economic growth. And uh, speaking of the pandemic, I'm wondering what is it like working in Congress now during the pandemic? It probably slows everything way down. It certainly does slow everything down. As I mentioned earlier in our interview, um, votes take uh, maybe 45 minutes to an hour per vote. So if you have a series of, of five or six votes, there, there's four or five hours uh, going through votes that would have taken uh, oh, maybe an hour, um, or an hour and a half at most before. So that, but we're all getting used to it. Uh, we're getting used to doing video conferencing our our committee work is now done pretty smoothly uh, on, on video conferencing. And I think that's important um, for the first, the first few trials uh, of video conferencing for committee work were pretty rough. 
uh, but we've gotten better at it, uh, and I think that's important. People want to get, uh, people want to move forward. You know, an Energy Commerce and Commerce Committee is very bipartisan. We want to all work together uh, to get things done on infrastructure and on telecommunications. I'm very involved in artificial intelligence. I think it's a tremendous field. There's big risks, so we need to uh, to make sure we understand it and, and put the right guardrails in place. Um, and so uh, we may differ on ideas uh, across the aisle, but uh, there's still a real impetus to work together, and uh, there's a lot of motivation to get things done right now. So the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, we only have about 30 seconds left here. Uh, it's growing. There's at least 14 members now. Do you expect to gain more members from the new Congress? I do. Uh, we're, we're growing over time. Uh, I think people were, were initially reluctant to join because uh, potential backlash, but that hasn't really happened. I think people understand that we need uh, we need a, an approach uh, in government to uh, science-based, evidence-based. Uh, we need guardrails against uh, um, legislation and laws that might weaken the separation of church and state. So it's it's a, a broad organization, and I think a lot of people are going to be more attracted to it in the, in the coming years. Well, we're certainly grateful that you are such an active part of it and for joining us today and all your environmental work, uh, Congressman McNerney. Thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.